For Crema Media, I'm Lungilen Gompe. Joining me today is Identity Partners Principal Partner, Sonia Debrain, here to discuss the significant role of women in various parts of the economy. Can you talk about the process that went into creating the woman-led investment company, Identity Partners? In terms of the investment holding company, Identity Partners, um, which was founded in 2008, it's women-led, Johannesburg-based, and essentially the sectors that we wish to invest in, uh, um, as you frame the question, it's not so much sectorally driven, but more driven on the basis that we wish to increase women's representation and participation in sectors where traditionally we have not found women being active. Um, and so as the economy is opening up and the BE legislation has facilitated opportunities for women, as there are more moves towards localization and involvement of South Africans, um, in large projects, we wanted to make sure that women women were present. And so those uh, opportunities have tended to be um, in the infrastructure space. And uh, for example, I can give transport as an example. We were previously invested in a German rail brake manufacturing company called Knorr Bremser. Um, we subsequently exited that investment when it came to our investment horizon. Um, we were previously invested in Altron's NetStar, also exited that investment when it came to investment, its investment horizon. So that is in the transport space, as you know. Um, and we have currently coverage in areas such as um, health instrumentation. Um, in, uh, with a company called Beckman Coulter. It's part of a US listed Danaher group. We also are invested in a, in a business called Hach, which is also part of the Danaher group, which uh, looks at water testing and instrumentation. We are also invested in a mining project called Vizirama. Um, it's it's um, very early stage in the chrome space with a, a Chinese partner called Min Metals. They're one of the uh, state-owned Chinese conglomerates. Um, and the project which is probably most interesting and I think will have some common themes um, for your article with some of your other interviewees is a project called Gibela, which is in the rail manufacturing um, space. It manufactures rail coaches, passenger coaches, um, and it is the only facility of its kind on the African continent. Um, so we're very privileged to be part of the 30% local shareholders in that project. Um, and so hopefully this is a demonstration of the fact that these are not sectors where traditionally you might find women. You know, early on, business opportunities for women were, for example, in cleaning or catering businesses, which are good businesses to be in, but those tended to be, to be more of the softer services facility management and so forth. So we describe it as maybe taking women into the harder spaces. It's hopefully also an opportunity for women to have a seat at the table because with each of our investments, we also request that there is a board seat that we participate in um, and that we are able to influence the procurement decisions, the supply chain, opportunities, the hiring opportunities that occur in that company by virtue of having a board seat um, and influencing the strategy of the company to the extent that we can get more women involved in that investment and in the sector. Can you tell us more about Gibela's locomotive manufacturing capability and yeah. the company's commitment to socioeconomic development? That's a lovely question, Lumkile. The only thing is, as I said, it, it uh, manufactures passenger coaches. Um, and the key, the key uh, client is Prasa, um, whereas locomotives are manufactured for Transnet. In that case, they're moving freight. But, you know, the reason it is so interesting and important, the rail sector overall, as you know, is the lifeblood of an economy in terms of moving goods and moving people. So both on the freight side and addressing 
the universe of Transnet. Those projects are important. And equally, uh, we are very proud of the Gibella project, which is addressing the needs of passenger rail in the country. Process currently the monopoly, as you know. Um, and so that's how we address that market through a long-term contract with Prasa. But for me, um, our ability as Ubumbano, who are the 30% shareholders alongside Alstom, who are the 70% shareholders, they are the global OEM, French nationality of, of uh, train expertise, as you know. Um, that partnership comes together so well in not only increasing accessibility of commuter transport in South Africa and thus um, our commuters' efficiencies with regards to getting to and from work every day at an affordable price. We know that petrol and fuel is getting more and more expensive and, and therefore alternative modes are becoming more and more expensive and eating into the overall pay packet of our commuters, but also the cleanliness, the safety of our trains, which gives people dignity and an ability to get to and from work in a much shorter time span every day, not spending so much time queuing, waiting for transport and a long journey, you know, in traffic to and from work. And so enhancing our people's lives and giving them that better quality of life makes such a difference on an individual and a personal level over and above as we can um, um, uh, uh, assume the economy-wide efficiencies that come out of that. So the evolution of, of the Gibella train and the you, you've seen the blue train, Stimela Sabantu, um, and the reclaiming of certain corridors, passenger corridors where Prasa trains um, travel. Some were inaccessible, there was vandalism and otherwise Prasa has been progressively been claiming back those corridors so that trains can run on them safely. Overall, if that ecosystem can work better, there are many, many benefits for South Africa, for South Africans, for our commuting public and for lower income commuters where that makes a huge difference. Um, a point of pride about this facility, uh, Lumkile, you'll be interested to know is that it is the, the most efficient and most modern Alstom-related factory in the world. So as I mentioned, it's the only plant of its nature, i.e. manufacturing trains on the African continent so far, not assembling, manufacturing. And then because it is the newest factory in the Alstom portfolio, we had an opportunity for the most modern technologies to be deployed here for our people to have skills transfer from international experts who were here, but also for our staff to be trained at other Alstom facilities and come back to South Africa. So in terms of the production time, the tag time of trains coming off the production line and in terms of the, the quality of those trains in terms of being approved for, for checking and acceptance by the clients, those are all um, in, in good line with global standards and, uh, in fact, the best performing um, plant in the world in their portfolio and mainly run by black South Africans because we've had a deliberate program of making sure that over time all of the skills were embedded in South Africans and the expertise and skills transfer that we had from our expat partners is now less and less um, required on a full-time basis. And we had the right promotions of our local staff. We're attracting the right talent. We have over 42% of the workforce being female. Um, and so really trying to make sure um, that it is set up to have the right impact for our communities as well. How would you describe the current South African economic landscape? What are the chief opportunities and risks that you think we face? Yeah. So, you know, it's good that you combine risks and opportunities in your question because it is the case that where there are challenges in an environment where we are facing risks, obviously um, that risk needs to be managed and mitigated, but at the same time, there are opportunities within that. And if you can manage those risks, price for those risks, 
um, and get appropriate returns, then the the challenges are not insurmountable, and one can can see how to try and optimize yourself within that environment. So in South Africa, I think we know the broad brush of of risks and challenges they have uh, been obtaining in the power sector, the energy sector, equally infrastructure related, transport related, as I've mentioned. Um, look. An, an overall uh, challenge which is emerging now is also in the water space. Um, and so these are issues which, as we address them, hopefully do start to, to also give business an opportunity to get into those value chains and ecosystems. Do you think the financial services sector is adequately realizing and respecting all of the attributes that women bring to the fore in leadership roles. If we speak about the financial services sector in general, if I was to ask you guys, when do you think it became legalized? I'm sure you, it wouldn't even cross your mind that there was a time when it wasn't allowed for a woman to open a bank account without her, her husband's signature or a man's signature, father or brother, without a, a co-male signatory. I think you'd be shocked that it was only in the late 70s in, in countries like the US and the UK, you know, let alone in South Africa. Um, you know, other data points are the fact that it's often the case that women don't have access to the title deeds of the, the homes, the properties, that they live in, that they share with their partners. And those, those couple of data points, I mean, there are others that we could talk about, right? Being able to access a loan um, on, on her own without a co-signatory. Those are all pathways to achieving income, to starting a business, to achieving independence, having a bank account, being able to access a loan, using the security from your home, to start a business, right? And I've chosen those examples because they all touch on financial yeah. institutions. So you can even imagine if that's on an individual basis and how many millions of South African women or African women, because we are half of the population, that that touches, the dampener that that puts on access to opportunities. And then on the other side, on economic growth, because those opportunities are not realized. And then when it comes to women in business, now let's say more formal business or medium to larger size businesses, it is still usually the case and research has shown that, you know, a woman business owner can go to the bank to speak uh, with the bank manager about facilities for, for her business. And she goes with her male counterpart, her male colleague who maybe is working for her. But the, the way that the bank or the financial institution relates to them, they will still primarily relate to the male in the room, although she might be the business owner. And, you know, we know some of the, these examples because luckily now institutions are becoming more aware of it. And so in terms of retraining their staff and ensuring that they also have more female frontline employees so that it is more comfortable for women to relate to. And then if, I, if maybe time allowing, I can just give another, a further example of maybe the lost opportunity, but the opportunity that is now being understood through all of the diversity and inclusion work that's been done by institutions is having more women in key decision-making roles, not only in the C-suite, also on the boards of companies, because those women represent a large demographic, either of the workforce of that bank or financial institution. And so an understanding of the, the environment women are in every day at work um, and what, what, is, what can make it more relatable, more affirming for them, ensure that there's more longevity in their careers, more success to be able to reach the top. And then influencing broader strategy decisions, policy decisions in that workplace. For example, you know, the pay gap, that is something that, you know, many companies are trying to tackle to make sure that there's equal pay between men and women, you know, doing the same job. Hopefully the Companies Act that was signed last week into, 
into law by the president. That company, as actually you guys might know, is going to um, enable or require, I should say, companies to give better financial disclosure about the wage gaps in their businesses. And hopefully conscious companies will also start to make sure that a gender wage gap, wage gap is also part of that. So not only the broader wage gap, but also making sure that there isn't um, huge disparities between how men and women are paid. That was Identity Partners' principal partner, Sonia Debrain, discussing the significant role that women play in various parts of the economy.